I think we can get started. So welcome everybody to our first ever webinar. We're happy to bring this presentation to everyone in attendance. My name is Jessica Pearson, and I'm currently the chair of the Verona Environmental Commission. And I'm joined tonight by hardworking VEC members, Sarah O'Farrell, Mike Alteri, Brooke Berardo, um, all dedicated to our cause, and of course, Dr. Fouad Dahan, who will be our presenter. We are also proudly joined by members of Verona's Green Team and their fearless leader, Steve Neal, who we thank for giving us this platform to present on tonight. By way of a brief introduction, the Verona Environmental Commission is established by statute and can have up to nine members, all of which must be residents of the township and serve to improve our township's overall environment environmental wellness without compensation. Uh, the VEC is empowered to conduct research into the use of open land, uh, to make recommendations to the council or the planning board on preservation or other uses of both public and private lands within the township. And we are also empowered to make policy recommendations concerning water resource management, solid waste management, um, soil, landscape and waterway protection, flora and fauna protection, and air quality. Um, tonight, our presentation focuses on a very wide-reaching topic, PFAS, or PFOAs, uh, found everywhere and unfortunately going nowhere soon, <laughs> not going anywhere. Um, you should all have access to a chat box, and we ask that any questions that arise throughout this uh, webinar type them into that box. And at the end of the presentation, we will be asking your questions to Fawad and he'll do uh, his best to answer them. At the conclusion of the presentation, he will handle that. And just a, a note, questions regarding Verona's particular actions or situation with PFAS are probably should not be posed tonight because Fawad, Dr. Tahan is not the expert working on our particular issue. Um, so any questions that you have that are specific to Verona, please uh, send an email to the township manager because he is the person who would know that. Um, so Dr. Dahan, Dr. Fuad Dahan will be giving this presentation. Mr. Dahan has over 20 years of experience as an environmental engineer. His professional work includes designing and researching environmental treatment applications remedial systems and monitoring systems. And he has put his expertise to work on Superfund sites and brownfield cleanups for federal, state, and private clients. Dr. Dahan is a graduate of American University of Beirut, gained his master's in chemical engineering from Drexel University, and received his PhD from Purdue University. He is a principal of SESI, a consulting engineering firm located in Pinebrook, New Jersey, and we are honored to have him as a member of the Verona Environmental Commission. Without further ado, Dr. Dehan. Thank you, thank you, Jessica. And welcome all to this webinar. Uh, uh, let me just get myself set up here. All right, good, good evening all and welcome all to this uh, webinar. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, this webinar is about a, 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 a specific set of chemical collectively called PFAS. Uh, uh, the reason why, uh, you know, we thought it would be interesting because this is what we call now a, a, an emerging contaminant that is it has been used since the 40s in, in the United States and everywhere in the world. It has been very, very, very widely used. And just in the early 2000s, we started realizing its, its health effect and how common it is in the environment. And all the regulatory uh, communities and regulatory agencies, they're starting picking, uh, getting, you know, getting their attention uh, 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 directed. To, to this specific type of chemicals. So starting, let's see. So what, what are PFAS? Uh, currently probably a lot of you have heard a lot, uh, several documentaries, there are a couple of documentaries on Netflix, even John Oliver did 
that that a small uh, a small uh, documentary on PFAS. So without getting into too much chemistry, PFAS they stand for they're they're commonly known for perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Okay, as it is here, uh, there are a group of contaminants. Uh, there are they, there are several molecules uh, of PFAS. There are about nine thousand different. Uh, uh, PFAS documented so far uh, or produced. Uh, it's very important to know that PFAS are 100% man produced. They're not naturally occurring, they're 100% industrial uh, produced. Okay. Uh, wh why they're important, why, why they were uh, used so much. So their common name is, is the forever chemicals, right? Uh, and and they are also known to be surfactant or surface active agent. So being forever chemicals and being surface active agents, those two properties or chemical properties made them very widely used uh, and, and they made them very practical in several uses. Uh, some of them is uh, because, <clears throat> uh, because they're, they're, they're surface active uh, agents, obviously, they're good coating uh, agents or good coating compounds. Uh, and usually surfactants in general, surfactants have the ability to dissolve in water and in, in oils, right? This is why soaps are so efficient in cleaning your hands when you have oil on your hands. If you just run water on your hands, oil does not go away. You add surfactants to soap, it will clean it up. This specific kind of surfactants, the PFAS, uh, they are both. They are they repel water and oil. Okay, so this is why they're very commonly used as a coating agent for food uh, for food packaging. We'll get into the uses in a second. The other the other important property because of their chemistry is that they are called forever chemicals, uh, meaning they are very stable chemicals, and because of their stability, they resist everything. Uh, they resist, and most importantly, they resist fire okay because of their stability and the resistance to the fire they have been used very commonly used as fire retardants or even uh, to put out fires uh, i will explain the putting out the fires in, in in a second so because of those two properties they have been very widely used in in uh, in uh, military uh, uh, installations to put up fires uh, when there, you have major fires of airplanes or what have you. And they have been ve very, very popularly used as coating agents for, for clothing and different food uh, elements. Now, a little bit in the presentation, I'll explain what's the difference between C8 and C6. The most commonly used or produced PFAS so far are what we call C8. So, you know, if you're searching the literature, or if you're looking at any documentary, there are, you know, the PFAS had several names in, uh, historically, but the, the three most commonly used names are either PFAS, whatever chemicals, or C8. C8, they refer to their uh, basically structure here because it has eight carbons in the molecules, okay? Now, uh, uh, because the, the first PFAS produced were all C8s and the regulation are following the C8s, some manufacturers now are reverting to C6 or what is commonly known as the G6, a G, a Gen X. C6 is very similar molecule, but instead of having eight carbons, we have six carbons. Where, where, where are PFAS? Where are they? They're, they're literally everywhere. They're literally everywhere. So this icon here, or this, this, this small drawing here is just a small explanation of where you could find them, okay? So you could find them in pesticides, in all stain resisting products. If you're, if you're wearing a, a, any type of clothing that has stain resisting to it, PFAS, most likely it's coated with PFAS, fire fighting, uh, fire fighting, fire fighting foams, in microwavable popcorns, makeup, pizza boxes, paints, cleaning products. Most, most cleaning products contain uh, PFAS nail polishes, dental floss, Teflon, non-stick cockware Teflon, uh, water resist resisting clothing, shampoos contain PFAS, uh, candy wrappers, sandwich wrappers, fast food packaging wrappers, they're, they're, they're almost everywhere. 
So this, these are the common consumer product that you find PFAS in. And in another, in another what we call non-source uh, point or uh, point in the environment is, as I said earlier, they resist the fire. So when, when, when you, you, know, you have incinerators and the incinerators are, are basically burning the garbage and the, as we know, as you know, because the garbage contains a lot of PFAS, PFAS does not burn at the temperature of, at which the incinerator burned the garbage. But what happens is they became airborne and they get distributed everywhere. And then eventually they will make it through the soil and through our waters. Uh, their history in brief, uh, basically the, you know, the PFAS, uh, if you will, research R&D started in the 40s, the first production, mass production started in 1947. In 1951, this is when they were used as Teflon, as coating, they were discovered as, you know, uh, the, their coating property was discovered and then everything else was coated with PFAS. In 1960s, this is when the aqueous film for, forming foam, and this is their firefighting property, was first used and developed between the 3M and the Navy. And then those AFF have been used mainly in military sites, but also uh, uh, and, and civilian airports, but also have been used uh, in, in local firefighting uh, departments. In 1999, the EPA and 3M find the the PFAS, so uh, so like I said, PFAS is an overarching name for all the type of uh, uh, alkyl sulfates. PFOA and PFAS, without giving the, the their boring chemical name, there are two specific chemicals that are the most widely produced or used uh, uh, between the PFAS, between the 9,000 compounds. PFOA and PFAS are the most commonly used or produced. So in 1999, the EPA and 3M uh, uh, found that the uh, that PFAS uh, contamination is appearing at blood banks around the country. In 2000, uh, 3M announced the voluntary stop of production of PFAS and PFOA. However, they were producing alternatives uh, that were that I originally said they are known as the C6 PFAS. Uh, finally, in the early 2000s, the EPA started finding that the PFA is, uh, is most likely a human carcinogen. Then in, in 2012, this is when the health effect, the human health effect started, uh, started uh, being demonstrated, right? So uh, there were, you know, this is when the first medical study that linked the PFOA to several human health uh, uh, diseases, if you will, including testicular cancer, kidney cancer, high cholesterol, and several other uh, dysfunctions of the human. In 2016, this is when the EPA first started regulating the, 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 the PFAS. It's not fully regulated. It was just a health advisory, and they set the levels of PFAS, uh, mainly the PFOA and PFAS. As I said, these are the most commonly used molecules of the 9,000 PFAS molecules, they set it at 700 parts per trillion. I will explain what, is a 700, what does 70 parts per trillion mean in a cell. Uh, the human health, uh, you know, for PFOA and PFAS mainly are uh, high cholesterol, uric acid, increased uh, uric acid levels in blood, decreased antibody response following vaccination, as well as increased, uh, increased blood levels of some liver enzymes uh, when PFOA is found in the body. Uh, in, in some documentaries that I've seen, uh, there were some birth defect uh, uh, reported for, for, the, for mainly the people who were working on the processes of the PFAS. So they were at very high level of exposures. There were some animal studies also that were done or were conducted on uh, uh, to determine the PFAS uh, health effect. And they found, uh, again, adverse health effect on animals, including problems with liver, kidneys, immune system, a development of, uh, of offspring and in association with cancer. Uh, based on available uh, information across uh, 
different sexes, uh, different sexes and uh, life stages and duration of exposure, the liver appears to be particularly sensitive to oral exposure to PFAS. Uh, regulations. Uh, I mean, the key here uh, is basically now we have it in the environment. It's not fully regulated yet, but we're going there. Um, we'll just give a brief on where we are at on, on the regulations. So I did mention before the Safe Drinking Water Act, the US, US EPA under the, uh, the Safe Water Drinking Act in 2016, they issued a, a life health advisory of 70 nanograms per liter or parts per trillion, nanogram per liter and parts per trillion is the same thing, uh, for individually for PFOA and PFAS in drinking water. So PFAS is not, is not listed under CERCLA. Uh, comprehensive Environmental Response uh, Compensation Liability at CERCLA, okay, which is commonly known as the Superfund Act or Superfund Law, okay. Uh, this, uh, however, in 2021, just last year, six, six or seven months ago, the EPA restarted the process to designate P5 before us as hazardous substance under CERCLA. What that means uh, that at, up to this point, P4 and PFAS, they're not considered hazardous material, although despite all the, the knowledge we know about their adverse health effect to, to the human health and the environment and the ecological systems, they're still not classified as hazardous material under the federal law. It has been, uh, we'll see in a little bit that it has been regulated at state levels, but at federal levels, there is nothing yet, but there is a lot on, on, in the world. It is not in another uh, act that I did not mention here, TASCA, which is uh, the TASCA is another EPA law that, that, that governs the use and the management of any hazardous substance, right? So there are other, several hazardous substances that we, we still use because we need them in the environment for manufacturing or what have you. If they are under the, the TASCA law, they kind of, they, they're regulated and their discharges, we decrease their discharges over the years because of the TASCA law and CERCLA combined. Okay, uh, the the PFAS are not are not regulated under TASCA yet, but it is in the works. Well, in I will I will go over this in a second. As I mentioned earlier, PFAS are very commonly used in in uh, in, cons in commonly consumer products and in certain uh, food packaging. The FDA. Uh, have uh, have some some allowed or permitted uh, PFAS to be used in certain food packaging. However, just lately in just January 2021, a year ago, one type of PFAS that was uh, which is six dash two, uh, six column two FTOH, uh, which is one of the PFAS that was commonly used in food 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 coating. Uh, the EPA uh, announced that three manufacturers will voluntarily stop the production. Again, it's still voluntary. It's not. It's not regulatory uh, halt yes, or, or yet or stoppage of, of this production. Uh, other regulation on a state level. Uh, several uh, states are considering stopping the PFAS, the exposure of people through PFAS consumer products. Like in California, they're considering consumer products like carpets, rug, and leather treatments. In New York, food packaging. In Maine, uh, food packaging. In Washington, food packaging. But, but I mean, th this is a very big challenge to, 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 to stop it in, in food, in, in consumer products, because, because of their properties that I mentioned earlier, and most, most importantly, the firefighting property, unless we have a safe, uh, a safe alternative, it's going to be really, really hard to say, just stop the production or stop using it in, in, in food products. Now, the, the consumer products, not a big deal. I mean, it's okay to, to have some fat going through the, the, the paper or what have you. But when it comes to firefighting, when it is, when you have a major health, uh, uh, like instant health hazard that may happen or the risk that may happen because of an engine blowing up because, you know, the fire is coming to the, to the, to the gas, gas, uh, gas tank, right? And you have PFAS at hand and you can use it to turn off the fire. It's really hard to find a, a an alternative to this use. Eventually we will come up to an alternative to this use, but at this point, I think everyone is facing this dilemma to stop it completely from being a, a consumer product. Uh, closer to us here in New York, uh, 
the ground, the water, uh, the water health, uh, the DEC is, has issued two water human health uh, levels of PFAS, which are for PFOA at 6.7 PT, uh, parts per trillion or nanogram per liters, and for PFAS 2.7. They're not uh, regulations yet. Uh, the DEC has, has issued uh, its recommendation. I think it's at the governor's office to be signed, or it's going to be signed soon. It's going to become a law soon. In New Jersey, the MCLs for, for PFAS, uh, we regulate here just three, three PFAS compounds, which are the PFNA, PFOA, and PFAS, 13, 14, and 13 parts per trillion or nanogram per Just to illustrate, just to give you an idea on, on what, what does 3PPT mean? So 3PPT means one drop. It's like one drop that you use to, for your eye, this little of a drop, okay? Which is 0 0.05, 0.05 milliliters of PFAS. It's equivalent to one drop of PFAS in 19,000 Olympic pools. Uh, this, is, this is how low the concentration is. And I mean, the other reason why we are able to, to, to now regulate or, or monitor those PFAS is uh, before 2000s, the analytical methods in the laboratories were not able to detect PFAS specifically at those levels. Now we are able, like, you know, I do, uh, Jessica introduced me as an environmental engineer, we do a lot of PFAS sampling and we are able to get PFAS samples as low as one parts per trillion in, labora in, commonly, in commonly present laboratory now in, the, in New York and in New Jersey. So where are we at? So the good news is that, in a way, the good news is that just the last October, uh, the, the, the administration here signed the, the act or they signed a law with the EPA that they called the roadmap in which the EPA has set a regulatory roadmap uh, between 2020, uh, uh, 2020, 2024 to basically regulate the, the, the PFAS and the way that, that it will be regulated, it will be, it will start by researching the PFAS, uh, restricting their use and remediating it. Researching uh, the EPA in their roadmap, they explain that they're gonna try to understand more its effect uh, to the human health, the ecological effect and the, the effect on the environment, the waters, the soils. And uh, the objective is to build uh, better standards for it. To, and part of the research also is to understand its behavior in the environment. So once it's released in the environment, how does it travel from the air to the soil? Then how does it travel from the soil into the waters? All these are important for me as an engineer, uh, the behavior of it in the environment, so that I'll be able to treat it or, or catch it before it gets, say, if I'm trying to protect an aquifer, I want to understand it's, it's the, the PFAS behavior before it makes it to the aquifer, which we know some of it now, but there is still a lot of it under development, the behavior of those chemicals. Uh, restrict, and this is, this is the key here. Uh, again, I've, I've done a lot of PFAS treatment for groundwaters. Uh, so far, I've applied, applied it two or three times so far. Uh, 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 and, and for soil and for other media that it, in part of my work. However, if the, 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 the issue that I face on a daily basis is that, okay, we clean the land today or we clean the groundwater today or we clean whatever today, but the source is still present. And the source is, as I mentioned earlier, is everywhere, right? I mean, if if we cleaned it up and one of the construction worker was cleaning it up and wearing a Tyvek suit. This Tyvek suit is a source for what we just cleaned up basically. So, and you know, the good thing is that the roadmap, the EPA in the roadmap, the, one of their main main uh, pillar, if you will, of this roadmap is to restrict the use of PFAS and regulate it. Hopefully it will be regulated better under CERCLA or TASCA so that we stop it upstream or we stop it at the source. And finally, once we understand the first two, we stop the source, we understand, we understand it more, we understand its behavior, we will be able to remediate. We already have few remediation techniques for groundwater, but we still need a lot to develop it. Uh, to, 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 we still need a lot of technologies to be able to tackle it better. 
So just here, this is a brief, what are the AFFs and why they're very commonly used. So the AFS or the, uh, the forms, the firefighting forms, they, they're mainly used to, to turn off class B uh, flammable, uh, flammable fuel fires, okay? And they're the most efficient in turning them off. And they have been saving few lives or a lot of lives, not few lives, a lot of lives when, when you have, a, again, if you're on the highway, you have a car burning, and it's about to reach the gas tank by shutting down the fire you are saving few catastrophes basically uh, the aff have been used uh, as fire suppressions in fire training uh, in, in it's very commonly used in military installations so i don't know if you heard there are a few cases uh, in new york i think in in one of the air forces in new york uh, air bases in new york and there is another one in in north carolina i believe where the AFF, the PFAS levels reached like hazardous levels in the waters for the, for the surrounding communities. So usually the, the sources of PFAS are, you know, if you are near a landfill because of all the garbage that contain PFAS, it eventually leach from a landfill that is not properly designed. If, you, if you're near a firefighting facility, or even if, you know, the, 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 the community firefighting departments are not as big of a source because usually they tend to have their, their PFAS containers, if you will, contained. They're not used. Uh, they're not used in big uh, in big uh, in big quantities as it is in in say in the military in the military site or or military training facility. Uh, uh, finally, I mean, uh, and as big of a problem at the uh, the PFAS is the good news is that for our drinking water, we can treat it with very commonly present technology, which is simple activated carbon. It's specific, you know, there are several types of carbon that are different sources. The most common, the most efficient activated carbon uh, that have proven to be efficient in removing PFAS from groundwater is what we call the bituminous uh, carbon or the coal-based carbon. Again, I think, I, I don't know what the Brita is made of. I'm not trying to make a commercial for Brita, but Brita contain activated carbon. I don't know if it's bituminous or, or, or some other kind of activated carbon. But uh, again, the good news is that PFAS is uh, uh, activated carbon. is very efficient in, in treating the PFAS. Actually, this is, I have used it on six, six different, on six, on six different installations to treat water before we release it to surface water. Uh, to contaminate groundwater before release it to surface water or, or even municipal water and it, it it works very well and another commonly present uh, iron iron exchange or iron exchange sorry uh, iron exchange is another common technology that has proven very efficient in uh, removing pfas from our drinking water And this is something a little bit more engineering details. We don't need to get into it. Uh, at this point, I will say thank you and I will open the floor for questions. Uh, I think the questions will be managed by uh, our Verona Environmental Commission team. Jessica? Yeah, do you want to turn off the uh sharing your screen sure okay so we'll come back in one thing i wanted to just before the first question that came in um everybody i think is very curious to know do those little carbon things if you put that a little carbon thing in, in your water system is that going to protect you at all from pfos you know, the little carbon, carbon filters carbon. in your, in, on your sink, on your. It, it does. It does. I mean, there are, uh, it, it does to a certain extent. Yes. I, you know, it's, it's always good. I mean, it's, it's always good to take your water and test it to be sure. Right. Because you, you, you need two things. First, the type of carbon and second, how much, how long is the, is the water staying in this carbon filter? Right. Uh, technically called residence time, right? So when the water is flowing into the carbon filter, how long the water is staying in touch with, 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 the, uh, with the carbon filter, right? And the longer it stays, obviously, the more, the more treatment it's doing, right? The PFAS, because they're, they're very soluble in water and they're very hard to take, they need a little bit longer, uh, little bit long uh, residence time. 
or, or they, they need to stay a little bit longer in the filter and touch with the carbon. But I, I think a, a, a good size carbon filter that you install under your faucet should take care of it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we have one question. I'm kind of surprised we don't have a lot more questions, but I thought um, Mr. Lamb asked, I thought there was some experiment done that kills PF, uh, PFAS at 373 degrees Celsius. So why wouldn't it work? Why wouldn't they get killed off in a furnace? And maybe he, I think he asked this around, around when you were talking about the incineration and how for some reason they don't, uh, they're not taken care of. I'm, I'm not aware about of this and I, I need to read it to, to know how it was uh, destroyed at 373 uh, Celsius. Was it just pure burning or was it combined with other oxidation technique? It depends. Or was it combined with electric? At, at those temperatures, I, I, my suspicion is that they were used with what we call electro oxidation or some kind of other oxidation, not on temperature alone. Uh, temperature alone, we're looking at thousands of the, the degrees Celsius, I think. Thousands, okay. Uh, and, um, and otherwise it would not turn off a fire. This is why it turn off, it puts down a fire. Um, a follow-up to the question I asked. So the whole house filters that are installed with water softeners, will those treat PFOAs and PFAs, PFAS? Mm -hmm. You know sure what filter we're talking about. I mean, the water softener right. is complete, something completely different. Just water softener, right? Again, the filter has to contain uh, uh, activated carbon. Just make sure to read on the filter that it contains activated carbon, and if the activated carbon is the bituminous type, which is the which is made out, which is or, or, originally from coal, right? Uh, Ion exchange, and this is a, it's difficult to use ion exchange because ion exchange are, are so the carbon is non-selective. It just absorbs everything, right? Mm -hmm. Ion exchange have to be selective, has to be rated for PFAS. If you have ion exchange filter in your home, you need to make sure that it's PFAS ion exchange. It's not any ion exchange that is going to work for PFAS. But carbon, you just want to know that this carbon is a, a coal-based carbon for it to work. The other work, but not as efficiently as, as the coal-based coal carbon. Okay. Um, one question asks, how and where can we have our home water tested? Uh, Is there a kit that a, a, a homeowner could buy that would give them a read or do they have to, who, who would they hire if not? It is uh, no, it's it's not common. I mean, I'm 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 an engineer and I'm a, I'm in the field, and it's hard to find labs now. I think now there are more lab, more and more labs being certified. I know of three or four labs here in New Jersey. I could tell you the names of them, and you have to send them separately. There is a lab called SGS. Okay, uh, there is a lab actually right here on Route 46 in Pinebrook, Pinebrook right near my office. They're called Aqua Pro Lab. I use them a lot for my own, for our own like engineering work. And uh, there is another lab called Alpha Laboratories. Uh, these labs, I use them, I work with them a lot and they do, they're certified in New Jersey to run PFAS analysis. Hmm. This is an interesting question. It's a health related one. Um, I'm five miles from the Solvay plant in West Deptford. My family suffers from gout. Raised uric uh, levels cause gout. Could there be a link between the, PF, the PFAS and their uric acid levels? I was reluctant on mentioning the Solvay case. Uh, and the reason why is I literally just read about it this Monday. There was a, an article in the news and what Solvay is doing, Solvay, they have uh, not the PFAS themselves. They have another type of chemical, which is very long name even for me. And I apologize for not saying it, right? So it's, it's a very long chemical that was used as an alternative to the PFAS, okay? And in New Jersey has, and again, this is the article that I have not read it yet. It's on, it's on my list of things that I have to, I need to read that was sent to me only on Monday. 
this past Monday, in New Jersey and JDEP is considering uh, the regulations of the Solvay. We, we're calling them the Solvay chemicals, right? Uh, there are two two of their chemicals that and New Jersey is has either regulated them or in the process of regulating them. And obviously, there is some fight back and forth, right? Now, what are their health links? I don't think I I, I don't know. Short answer, I don't know, but I think there are some health links that may be similar to the PFAS effect between the Solvay chemicals and, and whatever you're saying. But um, you know, I, I don't think there are final studies, but there, you know, for New Jersey to regulate them, probably they know something that they're causing a certain effect for the DEP to regulate them. Okay. I don't see any more questions. If anybody has a question, please type it in. Do uh, any of the other commissioners have any questions they want to ask? Unmute yourself and do it. I mean, I think I think everybody wants to know how we're going to handle the big problem at the end of the day. I mean, these uh, again, the whole forever chemicals uh, aspect of this that they're not going anywhere. They, we can't destroy them. They're just kind of here and they're not good for us. So how are we going to deal with them in our town, in our drinking water supply across the board? How are we mitigating this? So, I mean, as, as I kind of presented, right? The bad news that we have them, the bad news they have bad health effect, the bad news that they're everywhere, the bad news they're in all our environment. The good news is that we are regulating them. It's going to take a few years for us to regulate them better, to stop their, if you want, uh, random use in the environment so that even if they're still used, they're more uh, man used in a manageable way where we, we, we track where they go. They're not just released in the environment. Uh, this is one, two, one good news. The other good news is, so... Hopefully, eventually, we will stop them in all our consumer products. We, you know, all our wrappers, they don't want to contain PFAS anymore. Uh, all our makeups, I don't put makeup, but whoever put makeup. <laughs> there, there is no <laughs> there is no PFAS in makeups, right? Uh, and, and the other good news is that, again, a very common off-the-shelf technology, if you will, which is the carbon. And it's very, the carbon is uh, activated carbon. It's very commonly uh, it's abundantly present in in, in our system, in our uh, production. It, it can treat them for our drinking water, right? So, and, you know, obviously these are the, the, the used technology. There is a lot of more, uh, there are like at least six or seven under development technologies for treatment of the PFAS in, in drinking water that are under current development. So I have no doubt that, you know, as a scientific community in the US and around the world, eventually we'll come to a point where we will find an efficient way to treat them and stop them from getting to us. But, you know, and hopefully the EPA will, 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 will stay the course, if you will, where the number one thing is to stop their source, to stop them from being in our daily, uh, daily products, basically. Um, another health related question, are there any studies linking PFOS to breast cancer? I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of any, but does not mean it does not exist, but I'm not right. Sure. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, another one, the infrastructure bill has money for treatment of drinking water systems in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, et cetera. How many water systems are affected today? Do we even know? Or are they just, are you gonna just say all of them? <laughs> you know, because they're everywhere. My, my suspicion, a lot of them, but yes, uh, I, I could send it later, if you will. There is, there is, I think, a map that the NJDEP uh, has put out that has where which water sources are uh, have 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 certain subtype of PFAS in them. There, there is a, a map that was uh, put together. And it was on um, Spotlight New Jersey or New Jersey Spotlight's website um, that shows, but that just shows the uh, ones that 
when measured, had slightly over the 0.05 measure that you had mentioned per 19,000, right, 0.13 or 0.14, um, one drop in the 19,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. So, um, just a follow up to Mr. Lamb's question on this. Um, and, and again, you can find that map on Spotlight New Jersey or New Jersey Spotlight. I, I, I go backwards sometimes. Um, but is there fluctuation? If you measure it one day, you're going to be, you know, in compliance. And if you measure it three days later, you might be out of compliance. And a week later, you're back in compliance. Does it fluctuate enough to change the reading and the measure just on a, you know, like a week to week basis? Is there a, a good deal of fluctuation? Heavy yes. rain happens and all of a sudden you're in compliance kind of thing? Or the other way around. Uh, right. <laughs> or the other right. way around. The heavy rain brought out a lot of the PFAS on the surface and just uh, put it in the groundwater. So, so, so yes, I mean, the, sh the, sh the short, the short answer is yes, it may fluctuate. Now, I, I could explain for an hour, what are the flux, what are the causes of fluctuation, but I'm going to just like, you know, put it in a brief, what could change the fluctuation and this apply to PFAS or any, or any other thing that I measured in the groundwaters, right? So I measure groundwater today for any contaminant, I could come back in a week, it may be different for many reasons, because, you know, uh, the aquifers are not homogeneous. The aquifers uh, have different layers. I mean, the aquifer is, is where the water flow. We're, we're, digging, we're getting the water from very deep in the ground, where the geology is, is very different, right? And the geology is different because of the different rocks that are in, in, the, in the ground. The different rocks have different chemical properties, have different physical properties. Now, all this explanation, just to tell you, is that so the, the water flow may change and the water flow, depending on the temperature or what have you, depends which pocket of water is coming from where in this big aquifer may change uh, this concentration pulling out today, okay? Uh, plus, in, a very good point that you brought up, Jessica, is, is the rain. So the rain may be diluting it or maybe, maybe the rain may be bringing more PFAS, right? And also if you have certain PFAS in the soil, say at elevation, 120 and because of the rain the aquifer the whole aquifer became out 125 and now the water is in touch with the soil that was not it is in contact with the soil that was not in contact before and this contained PFAS so yes yeah, those changes e exist and only because of the nature complexity and they're not specific to PFAS they're specific to they're, they're common to any to, to any chemical basically that we we test for in the groundwaters right uh, now it's more so for PFAS. I want to add one more thing for PFAS here. Why it will the, the, the if you will the, the the variation in testing the PFAS is because it's everywhere, right? So uh, at some point, New Jersey regulation again, me being an engineer, so we had certain regulation how to test a what a, a well. Uh, the regulation mentioned that we had to use Teflon. To measure and it's still till now actually it has not been updated yet by the NJDEP. So the field the field technical book for for the NJDEP to go sample wells is to use Teflon tubing, right? And it's still in the regulation. It has not been updated yet, right? So obviously when I measure when when we're sampling for PFAS, we're not using we're not using Teflon anymore, right? But but not only the Teflon tubing that you're using. I mean you could find PFAS if, if whoever is sampling this, this water and by mistake decided to have a sandwich before coming did not wash their hands properly and their hand mistakenly touched the sample, it could influence the sample because they're so common, so ubiquitous in, the, in, in, the, in our use, everyday use and in the environment. This adds another level of variation, if you will, in, in the analytical results, in addition to the, all the complexity of the, of the earth itself, basically. Yeah. Um, so, sh short answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another question asks, what about areas uh, that are that rely on well water? Um, are they more prone than, you know, these big water utilities? Um, and then 
as a follow up to that, she asks, um, well, she adds many areas in South Jersey where DuPont made coatings for many, many products are they rely upon well water. Yeah, I would I would get my well tested. I would definitely get my well tested. Uh, by one of the labs that you mentioned yeah, <laughs> yeah in this area um, somebody else asked so you're saying that they would be more prone especially in those areas to I answer mean, that it, question it, it, I, I don't know I mean even even if it's it's not a simple it's not a simple yes or no question right I mean I need to see where the well is where the DuPont produce it and you need to see the aquifer if there is connection between the DuPont aquifer and the, the specific uh, well aquifer, the uh, specific well aquifer, and maybe if the, you know there are several things in the underground that could stop the com you know the communication in the water itself between two different uh, areas, right? Depending on the lithology, depending on the, the even on the geography of of the you know the uh, of the apparent uh, geography of of uh, where the well is, it. it it may or it may not, but if there is any doubt, just get your water tested, you know. Gotcha. Um, another question asked if we should feel comfortable drinking our tap water coming from the Passaic Valley Water Commission. Um, if it is tested, yes, I drink it, my water. Right. Right. <laughs> right. If it's tested, so, yeah. I mean, this this is. I mean, all all the. I think all the public waters are being tested now regularly for PFAS. If it's tested and below the levels, yeah, why not? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Anyone want to ask? I have a question. Go for it. God, in the paperwork, in the, the letters that were sent to Verona residents, alerting Verona residents about the PFAS, mm -hmm. in the letter it mentioned something about it's only, you know, very concerning if you have an infant. Could you speak to a little bit about that as to why it would, having various levels of PFAS in the, in the water would be more concerning for infants? Uh, so I don't think there are specific studies to show the, if, the effect, if you will, on the PFAS on adults versus infants, but I think only because infants are more vulnerable, if you will, for any possible health risk than adults. And even if we are a little bit above the health, uh, the, the health advisory or the, uh, the regulation, I think the numbers in Verona were 21 or 25 versus 14. The regulatory number was 14. I think the number here we tested at 21 or 25, which is not much higher than the regulatory, than the regulatory number. I mean, it's a little bit higher, not much higher, but it's still higher. You know, obviously anything on infant because of their size. And, you know, if you're giving one liter of water to an infant, if you like, you know, take the proportion of one liter for their mass versus one liter for an adult mass. So you're giving them more PFAS per gram, if you will, than what an adult would give. I think this is what it's resulting from. Again, I, 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 I don't have a clear answer for this. It's just, I'm speculating, you know, I'm just speculating. And I don't think there are specific studies to show the impact on infants other than, than compared to adults. Uh, the, the only thing that could be also the warning could be stemming from are the birth defects that were reported for certain for certain factory workers. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I think we've answered the questions that have come in. All right. Okay. That's it. Juan, Dr. Dahan, <laughs> I'll start calling you by your first name next week. Um, for right now, you're going to be remain Dr. Dahan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank the VEC members for helping pull this together. Thank uh, all of our attendees. Really appreciate you coming. 
Um, this will be uh, put on the VEC YouTube uh, page, as well as probably the Verona um, Townships uh, YouTube page um, in video form. So you can share it uh, for those who were not able to see it if they have an interest. And if anyone have anything that they want to say to close, Fuwa, do you have anything you want to say to close? Thank you. Thank you for this great uh, opportunity and this great forum. We appreciate you. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much for coming.